Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Depot Dive. We're going to deep dive into the biggest Steelers topics of the week. I'm Ross McCorkle, your host, and above me on the screen here, my co-host, Joe Clark. And Joe uh, had a little special treat the last couple days. He went to some playoff basketball. He's up in the Boston area and is a Celtics fan. Uh, Joe, how was that experience at your first uh, playoff game there? It was so much fun. The atmosphere was electric. Uh, TD Garden was as loud as I've ever heard it. Granted, I've never been to a playoff game, so obviously going to be louder than a regular season game. And then on top of that, it was an awesome game. I got the win in overtime, um, close game throughout, so it was a lot of fun. You went uh, with a buddy of yours, one of your roommates? Yep, yep. Nice. His his buddy had season tickets, so he got them off him, um, and we were able to hit the game. It was a lot of fun. That's awesome. All right, well, uh, we're going to move right into today's topics. The first one, obviously, off-season training activities, the first of, uh, well, actually, the first and second of 10 voluntary OTA sessions with the whole team. Uh, took place on Tuesday and Wednesday, the last couple of days, and the third one will be today. And then there's a few day break, and they continue the you know the rest of those ten practices uh, next week. But uh, yeah, there's been a lot of interesting kind of storylines to emerge from these OTAs so far. Uh, we had we got to hear for the first time from Justin Fields since being traded to the Steelers back in March. Uh, so obviously a lot m- much anticipated press conference there just since you know people were starting to wonder like why is this guy being hidden why, why have we not heard from him yet um, well you know we-, we-, we heard from Russell Wilson right away that's because he is kind of the intended starter fields I think right when he was traded for he was on some kind of vacation and and not even in the country so it wouldn't have been possible to have some kind of press conference right there so we got the first opportunity to hear from him and uh, just right off the top, the kind of most important thing that he said is, hey, I don't I don't have the mindset of sitting on the bench all year. And so he's kind of putting uh, everybody on notice uh, saying, you know, he's here to compete. He's here to try and win the job. I mean, a lot of people have kind of written it off as, well, Russell has pole position in Mike Tomlin's words, and he has the pedigree being a, you know, Super Bowl winning quarterback, even though that was many years ago. Uh, and so Fields is coming in and saying, you know what, I'm trying to compete. So what is some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I love the mindset. I love the attitude. Um, I think it's going to be tough for him, though, because if, I mean, like you said, Russ is the pedigree. Russ has had, you know, the better counting stats these last few years, at least throwing the football. Fields is, you know, a little bit inconsistent in that aspect of the game. Obviously, his athleticism super tantalizing, and maybe they could do something with that, but um, if I think if Russ gets the job, it's going to be tough to, you know, kind of turn the fields at any point if he plays well enough. I mean, if Russ really struggles, then yeah, sure. Give fields an opportunity. But then if he's really struggling, means the Steelers are really struggling and it might not be the best opportunity for him. I mean, he'll get to play. So, Hey, that'll be great. But, you know, given the setting, but, uh, I mean, yeah, I love that he wants to come in and compete and he said he wanted to come to Pittsburgh and that was really like one of the main places he wanted to be. So he wants to be here. He wants to compete. You got, you got to respect it. You got to like the mindset. I just, I'm not sure how realistic it is for him to, you know, maybe get any sort of significant playing time this season. And obviously it's early, so we'll see how things develop. But as it stands right now, I think it might be a little bit of a struggle for him to, you know, get on the field. Yeah, and at least, I mean, uh, you always worry with these quarterback controversies. Is it going to be a situation that's, you know, maybe between the two quarterbacks trying to start, is it going to be kind of hostile in that room? And I think, you know, we didn't write about this on the site, but uh, I'm sure, you know, a lot of Steelers fans saw it. Uh, Ty Dunn of Go Long, his substack there, posted a, a piece about Justin Fields and kind of the quarterback room in Chicago and his tricky, I guess, dynamic with some of the veterans in Chicago. I think Nick Foles and I can't remember who the other... Uh, Andy Dalton. Yeah, Andy Dalton. And so uh, it, it apparently wasn't the best situation. You know, it's from anonymous sources, so do with that information what you will. But um, yeah, it seemed like Fields wasn't, you know, maybe the most uh, receptive to learning from some of the, the older guys there in Chicago. Uh, now, so far, at least, they're saying all the right things. Russell Wilson, uh, you know, talking about competing and making each other better. Justin Fields talking about competing and making each other better. Fields was very upfront about uh, saying that he has a lot to learn from Wilson. And so, you know, that's another good thing you like to hear because you don't want to get into a situation where, you know, they feel like they're breathing down each other's necks and they start, you know, the, the, the fans might start 
I mean, if the Steelers do struggle, the Steelers fans have been booing a lot in recent years and the pressure could be ramped up uh, on, on Wilson and, um, you know, fans might want to see field sooner than later if the Steelers, you know, stumble really at any point during the season. That's kind of the, the trick of how, or the, the, the tricky situation of having two, you know, maybe starting capable quarterbacks. So, um, I just wanted to pose this question. Do you think, like, if I set an over-under of two and a half starts for Justin Fields, where do you come in? Are you you taking the over or the under on that? I would take the under. I mean, obviously, we don't have – we can't see into the future. We don't know about injuries, but I don't think he's going to start more than two games. I don't know if he's going to start any games. Uh, If Wilson gets the job and he plays well, which – it seems like, you know, he's a decent enough fit for Arthur Smith's offense. And uh, as we'll get into later, you know, it's an offense that's gotten a lot of praise very early so far in the OTAs. Um, so I don't think the team's really going to turn away from Wilson. And when you look at the Steelers' schedule, you look at that stretch run they have at the end of the season. Uh, I think, you know, stick with the veteran there and see what he can do if things are going well. I know Ryan Clark thinks that the Steelers, you know, might switch the fields around the bye, but – you're really throwing fields into a gauntlet there. You know, you got all your AFC North games, and then you have the Chiefs and the Eagles. So that might be a tough thing to do, but they also might want to see what they have in fields. Uh, so it, it, it's interesting. It's a, that's a good two and a half a good number. But as, as things stand right now, if Wilson's really in pole position and uh, the team thinks he's going to win the job and be the QB one, uh, I don't think he's going to be on the bench if he's healthy for three games a season. Yeah, I think I have a hard time seeing him start at any point prior to the bye week. I think the the two scenarios where you do see him start, and they're obviously unpredictable, is an injury to Russell Wilson, obviously, is, is, it would, would see Justin Fields start. But towards the end of the year, if the Steelers, I mean, they're in that brutal stretch, if they enter that brutal stretch in a bad spot, maybe not necessarily starting Fields at the right after the bye, but, you know, if, if you're at week... I don't know, 14 and your record is sub 500 and it's really looking, you know, nearly impossible to get into the playoffs. I could see them turning to fields just because, you know, they have every reason to want to see what they have in fields uh, for next year's contract negotiations. You know, are they going to commit themselves to a future with Wilson? Uh, obviously, if they enter the the back half of the season or the back, you know, third of the season in a bad spot with their record, I would find it hard to kind of see Wilson getting another contract at that point. Um, And then at, you know, from that point on, you would just want to see, all right, what do we have in fields? Um, So, you know, two and a half. uh, I think I might go ahead and take the over on that. Um, You know, I'm, I am optimistic about the Steelers chances, but between the possibility of an injury and just really the Steelers kind of needing to find out what they have in fields. um, I I, I could see it happening. Uh, Moving on to our next topic, and we kind of teased this earlier, talking about Arthur Smith, the new offensive coordinator. He's been receiving praise from, you know, several uh, of the offensive players at this point. I think it it started off on, I think even before OTAs even began, Mark Caballi of The Athletic saying that the Steelers players absolutely love Arthur Smith's offense. Um, and moving into OTAs that seems to be backed up by, you know, what, what some of the players have been saying. I think Justin Fields uh, praised the offense and, and kind of said, Arthur Smith is good at explaining the why behind things, uh, and he's moving things along slowly, making sure that, you know, uh, that the players have kind of the foundation and the fundamentals of the offense before throwing too much on their plate. So it sounds like it's, you know, a good kind of process for the team right now. And I think Pat Fryermuth said something about it as well. Um, just praising the offense and, and Arthur Smith. I think it's a huge change, obviously, from Matt Canada. The cr- criticisms there are well known. Um, what is your take on on some of the sentiments surrounding Arthur Smith so far? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a hire that, you know, as the months have gone on, when obviously when it was first announced, it was the biggest news. But, you know, I, we look we look at all the quarterback movement the Steelers have made and how they've kind of retooled their roster. And it's something that has maybe, you know, on the broader national media scope gotten buried a little bit of just how much of an upgrade Arthur Smith can be. Like, Matt Kennedy was bad. Like, last year, the preseason kind of fooled us. But, I mean, the, the offense was just bland. It was boring. It was basic. It was similar each week. And they just couldn't really put points on the board. Um, so, I think Arthur Smith is going to be a huge change. I mean, throughout the week, what – Kabali tweeted with the players, and then you look like 
Arthur Smith is a really good offensive coordinator. He was really good in Tennessee. He had the Titans, one of the best teams of the AFC with Ryan Tannehill at quarterback. And now they can kind of work and tailor his scheme. I mean, he's going to, the, the core concepts, a lot of that's going to be the same, but he can work with what Russell Wilson, with what was Russell Wilson likes. I mean, I mean, when Wilson was brought in his visit, we heard that, you know, the two met for hours and, you know, really loved what each other, what they were hearing from each other. So and, and, you know, like what Field said with him explaining, which is something that, I mean, I there was a podcast with Jay Sternberger of the Packers, and he said, Matt Canada just told you what to do, it didn't tell you why you were doing it. And, you know, you look at like how that's going to even impact the receiving game with uh, with Arthur Smith. Reception perceptions, Matt Harmon was basically talking about how Canada's scheme, there, there, there's no there's no rhyme or reason to it with the routes. There's You weren't helping guys out with their routes, helping them get open. They were just running routes. And that's something that Smith's really good at, even though, you know, he might not utilize the receivers as much, but he can get guys open. So I am super excited to see what this offense looks like under Arthur Smith. I mean, I, I think it's going to be a run heavy. You got Najee, you got Warren, and he loves to run the football. He did it with Derrick Henry. He did it in Atlanta. He had Tyler Algier was a thousand yard rusher two years ago. And last year, obviously, B. John Robinson. Um, so I'm excited to see how it works. And I think, a, I think Smith is really going to make an impact on this team and maybe – this team will win a game or two that maybe they wouldn't have last year without as talented of an offensive play caller. Yeah. I think the, the, the biggest thing, I mean, explaining the why behind stuff, uh, particularly for the offense was, I think uh, the second or third or fourth youngest in the league last year, having a guy like Matt Canada, who it seems like he wasn't really great at explaining the why and his, his playbook was simple and even with the simplicity that he wasn't really explaining the why which seems uh, you know I don't know how <laughs> I don't know how you get away with that but um I think just for, for some of the young guys I mean even Justin Fields entering his fourth year uh some of the young receivers just knowing the why behind things whether it's the route concepts or you know the offensive linemen why they need to be you know hitting certain spot at a certain time I mean that kind of stuff is invaluable um I just thinking from my own perspective, like when I learn something, I want to know the why behind it. Uh, and it sounds like Arthur Smith is actually uh, doing that, which, uh, yeah, that can only that can only be good for the offense moving forward. Um, moving into our third topic here, Patrick Peterson uh, appeared on the Jim Rome show, I believe it was, and stated once again his desire to return to the Steelers. Uh, now the Steelers do have a need at corner. Um, at least perceived by most to have a need at corner. Uh, they acquired Dante Jackson in the Deontay Johnson trade. Uh, he's probably going to be starting on the outside opposite Joey Porter Jr. So we think that they're kind of starting to seem to be solidified, but they have an issue with depth. They have an issue in the slot. Uh, Patrick Peterson would be a logical fit for both. He can play outside. He can also play in the slot. Um, and he did do both last year. He also played some at safety. I think his direct quote was, uh, th that is definitely the team that I want to play for. And he kind of cited Mike Tomlin as one of the reasons and, and cited some of the quarterback stuff uh, as well, the changes at quarterback. So how realistic do you think it is to bring Patrick Peterson back? And, you know, uh, do you think it will ultimately happen? I think earlier this offseason, it seemed a lot more likely and felt a lot more realistic. Um it's just, it's just tough right now. I mean, obviously the quarterback depth behind Jackson and Porter, you're looking, you know, like Corey Trice, Ryan Watts, Darius Rush. You're relying on a lot of unproven guys, but they did bring in Anthony Averett, who can kind of be, you know, maybe that third outside cornerback. And then you can work in with a fourth if you need to between Rush, Trice, Watts, one of those younger guys and see if they can step up. So now that they brought in Averett, I'm not sure how realistic it is. I think if he gets brought in, it would probably be if the team thinks he can be, you know, a solid slot option because – None of those guys in us said Averett has limited slot experience. Jackson has limited slot experience. You're looking right now in the slot. What do you look? You're looking at Beanie Bishop as your guy, which I mean, I his college tape, you broke it down. Um, he's he's a super, you know, charismatic guy. He played at a high level in college. So if he plays well, then yeah, maybe he can, you know, break in as an undrafted free agent and be that main option on the slot. But you know, Patrick Peterson talked last season. He said that the game kind of slows down for him in the slot. And as he gets older, maybe that's a better fit for him. Um, and I mean, Ray Fittipaldo said a bunch that the team might be waiting and seeing what the deal is with Cameron Sutton. We talked about it. They met with him. That is also another slot option. But given that they really don't have too many options right now to, you know, stick and play in the slot, 
if he comes back, that would be kind of where I think his primary role would be. Um, it's not something I think would happen until we get, you know, later in the summer. Last year, they had Quan Alexander during training camp. I don't think they're going to add Patrick Peterson before training camp. Um, it's He's one of those guys, he, he, he's older. He's not going to work a lot during OTAs or minicamp anyway. Uh, and the team knows what he is. He was with them last year. He knows the scheme. So you can kind of bring him in during training camp. If you need a body, you need, you think he can, you know, play a role. Um, I would put it at under 50% odds, I think. I'd probably say there's... I'd say there's a 70% chance he doesn't come back, but um, we'll see how things play out this offseason. We'll see how Bishop looks. Uh, but it's it's definitely an interesting thing to consider because they do they could probably use somebody else to you know maybe at least challenge in the slot. So if he wants to come back, he's motivated, he's in shape, then, I mean, yeah, maybe you, you throw a flyer on him. He's not going to get any sort of big money, one-year veteran benefit to bring him back. So uh, definitely an interesting thing to ponder as we get further into this offseason. Yeah, and I mean, there is the point of him now saying he wants to return to the Steelers multiple times. That's kind of, in some way, giving away a little bit of leverage just because, you know, they know what, kind of what he wants to do. It's not, uh, and, you know, I don't know if he would sign for a veteran, you know, minimum benefit kind of thing, uh, but definitely, certainly below the two-year $14 million they gave him, uh, you know, last time around. So I think i'm a little higher on the the odds of him returning just because you know he he kind of relished the role of playing mentor to guys like joey porter jr and uh you know i think that the the room overall is pretty young you got you know darius rush and and beanie bishop and Averett and Corey trice these kind of guys you know it would be beneficial to have a veteran like patrick peterson they don't have anybody else really like that in the room i mean what Dante Jackson's probably the most experienced or, or Averitt. And we don't even know if Averitt will make the roster, uh, at this point. And so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, if, if you had to rank between Shandon Sullivan, Cam Sutton and Patrick Peterson, and keep in mind, I think, uh, I think Shandon Sullivan's number just got given away, uh, to, I can't remember who was it Ward or I think it was Jonathan Ward that just received his number might've been Averitt, but if you had to rank those three in likelihood to return, how would you order that? That's a tough one. I'm, I might go with Sutton at the top right now because in terms of talent, I mean, it, the off-the-field stuff is obviously something that the team has to be comfortable with with bringing him back. But in terms of talent, he's the most talented option out there. Um, and and the, obviously Mike Tomlin, Omar Khan, they had got to be comfortable with him as a person and he spent six years in Pittsburgh. So they kind of know who he is. And this is a team that I think is really committed to competing and winning now. So I think bringing in the most talented player would probably be the most likely outcome. Granted, then you also have to consider the possibility if he faces, you know, a suspension from the NFL. I don't know if that'll come this year or come next year. That process has to, you know, play itself out. But in terms of talent alone, I think um, he would be number one. And then I'd probably go Peterson number two and Shannon Sullivan number three. Uh, Shannon Sullivan gave him some good reps last year, but I think given, you know, like you talked about Peterson's mentorship and how he can work with those young guys and he kind of embraced working with Porter Jr. And he can do it again. And Porter Jr. is still only in his second season, obviously top cornerback on the team now, different expectations than he was as a rookie, but he still could use a veteran, you know, kind of show him the ropes and that's, Peterson's a good guy to do it as, you know, somebody who's incredibly accomplished in this league. So I think I put Peterson ahead of Sullivan. Um, I, I think, I think I might have sought number one. I mean, they have the demonstrated interest that they met with them, uh, but you know, the week before the draft of court that Jerry Dulac reported. So uh, again, I think it's going to, uh, any one of them, well, it's going to be a, a process. We're going to have to wait until, you know, July, but uh, I would, I think I'm comfortable going Sutton one, Peterson two, Sullivan three. Hmm. I think the other interesting kind of thing that Peterson said in that Jim Rome uh, interview, which I touched on briefly, but he kind of discussed, I, I guess he texted Mike Tomlin and was, was basically saying, uh, you, you have a, you know, I think he said the word credible quarterback for the first time in a while. Uh, obviously he had really even dating back to Ben Roethlisberger's last couple of years. You think about the Doc Hodges year and then, uh, you know, having, Roethlisberger who was kind of a shell of himself the last you know season or two and then having Pickett and Trubisky and Rudolph and and so it's been a long string of kind of quarterback issues and and Peterson at least seems to think that Russell Wilson is the guy 
um, and, and believes, you know, that Tomlin, for the, la- for the first time in a while, has a credible quarterback back there. And so there's kind of like the, the almost FOMO aspect for Peterson. Like, he doesn't want to miss out because he thinks this team is going to be that good. And, you know, for a guy like Patrick Peterson, who's been in the league for so long, and he's been a part of, uh, unfortunately, not that many good teams with the Cardinals, but he, he had a couple of good teams in there. And then, you know, he, he, had, he had a good uh, run there with the Minnesota Vikings. So I think he, he kind of knows what a good team looks like. And so for him to say that kind of thing and want to come back, I think that tells me a little bit about, you know, what this team could be, at least uh, in, in the eyes of a veteran like Peterson. So that is kind of exciting. But um, a couple of housekeeping things that we wanted to talk about here, moving into uh, kind of a bonus fourth topic today, is uh, this, the Steelers signed now two new running backs to their roster. Uh, Jonathan Ward, I can't remember, was that Monday that that came through officially? Uh, yeah, it was Mon- I think it was either Monday, or, I think it was Monday, Monday or Tuesday. Yeah, so Monday, Jonathan Ward was, uh, I believe, signed to the roster. He was a uh, veteran player that was at the rookie minicamp. He was one of a couple, uh, you know, they make exceptions for some of these tryout players if they aren't on the roster, and and he qualified, and he made the most of it and, and got a deal, uh, uh, similar to how Anthony Averett was uh, brought in as well. And so he's a guy who hasn't touched the football a whole lot uh, in his career, but he did spend, you know, some time with the with a, with a few different teams, uh, the Cardinals and the Titans, and I think he was with the Jets uh, on maybe just on their offseason roster at one point. But um, yeah, he's he, he's an interesting guy. I think you know he. I, I broke down his tape on the site, and he uh, plays. He, he gets up to his top speed pretty quickly. He he seems to be a pretty decent receiver. I mean, albeit this is all with very limited tape to go off of, but. Uh, his special teams value is, is kind of the most important in the equation, especially for a running back four or, or for five even. Um, you know, I don't know if we don't like to say the word camp body, but um, they need guys like this in camp. And so, you know, he'll have an opportunity to compete for a, a role. And I think special teams will kind of be that avenue. And, uh, you know, he, he was a pretty decent special teamer uh, over the last few years of his career. So, He's an interesting one, and then if you want to take it away on kind of the, the, the breaking news of the situation here, just like minutes before we hopped on this podcast. Yeah, this might be the first time that anybody calls a little Michael Piron signing breaking news, but uh, <laughs> uh, former fourth-round pick, so he's got some pedigree. The Steelers did sign the Michael Piron. He spent last year with the Chiefs. Uh, he was on the practice squad in 2022, didn't play in the league. Uh, I think um, the Steelers might be setting up a RB4 competition between Piron and Jonathan Ward. Um the other thing to consider too is, you know, as you get through OTAs and you get through get into training camp, you want as many bodies as possible, especially at the running back position. You don't want to give Najee Harris too many reps. You don't want to give Jalen Ward too many reps. Najee Harris got hurt in camp two years ago. And so now they have, you know, they have Ward, they have Cordero Patterson. He's probably not going to get a lot of reps. He's what, 33 years old. Um, so you have Ward, you have Piran, you have Dijon Edwards, the undrafted fridge from Georgia, and you have Aaron Schlampkin, who uh, is on a futures deal. So it could be, it could be a three-man competition, you know, between Edwards. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't want to discount Aaron Schlampkin here, but I'm not sure he's going to be a key part of this competition uh, between Ward, P. Ryan and Edwards for that RB4 spot. Um, and one thing to know about P. Ryan too, I mean, he had two kick returns in 2020, but he's been, he plays most special teams uh, snaps last season with the Chiefs. He played 55 snaps on special teams in three games. So uh, as we talked about, Ward is a good special teamer. He's played a lot in special teams and the Steelers lost some in special teams and they lost, you know, Miles Boykin this off season. So having another guy who can kind of make plays on special teams is going to be important. So if Ward or P Ryan can, which, uh, it could be, it could be a one-to-one, whichever one of them can make the biggest impact and, you know, that facet of the game. So uh, yeah, good, to, good to add more bodies to the room. We know Arthur Smith likes to use his running backs and Cordero Patterson, might not even be classified as a true running back, you know. They put the Joker title on him in Atlanta last season. He can split out wide. He can play receiver. And his primary function is going to be as a kick returner. So, you know, Ward or Piran could maybe be another guy on that backfield who maybe only gets a few touches a season. But if they can play a role in special teams, then they'll have a role on the team. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. They, you know, lost uh, Miles Boykin. Like you said, they lost James Pierre. I think this year, more yep. than others, we're talking about it being maybe a little bit more difficult to kind of make our roster, our 53-man roster uh, projections just because of, you know, how, how are some of these special teams' roles going to be sorted out? Uh, they have a lot of guys that have some experience that, you know, might surprise and, and kind of make the roster through that avenue. And so uh, it'll 
become more clear the further we get into the process and training camp and all that. But yeah, something to keep an eye on with a pair of running backs joining the competition. Um, all right, well, we're going to move into our viewer question. Uh, call in, uh, left a voicemail for us. This is also a plug. If you'd want to have your question answered on a future episode, call the number at the bottom of the screen there. It's 412-254-3145. Leave us a voicemail, and we will answer your question at some point in a future episode. Uh, this one is coming from Eric C. out of Philadelphia. So I'm going to go ahead and play that. Hi, my name is Eric Copley. I'm out in the Philadelphia area. I have a question about with all those young offensive line players and having to play a lot of the AFC North late in the season, is there any concern you guys have with them not having such a long schedule in college and the um, the endurance that they will have when they meet the AFC North, like, strong defenses that um, – we're going to have to try to run against them, and that's going to be really difficult. Thank you. All right. So basically flipping – I mean, we, we talked, I think, a little bit last week about how it might be a positive to have some of these AFC North opponents late in the schedule just because of, you know, there's a lot of young and kind of new aspects to this offense, and it might give them more time to gel – Eric here is kind of flipping the question and saying, well, actually, is it is it a worse thing? Because specifically with the rookie offensive linemen and, you know, you talk about hitting the rookie wall in terms of late in the season, they're not used to playing a long season like in college, the, the season shorter. And so you get deep into the NFL schedule and you kind of hit that wall in terms of conditioning and and maybe their you know bodies aren't, uh, you know, NFL ready so early on in their career and, and, and all like that. And specifically with the AF, AFC North having great defenses around, is that going to become an issue? What's your, what's your take on that? Yeah. So I think at some point, I mean, everybody, every rookie can kind of hit a wall, the physicality of the NFL, you have, you know, all the off season work and the longer schedule. But I think in particular, when you look at Zach Frazier and um, not me, some Corbin and Troy Falatanu, they're, they're, they're two guys who are incredibly experienced in college, Fautano played, I mean, he did 15 games last season for Washington. I think they're both over 2,000 snaps in their career. So in terms of, you know, a rookie coming into the league, they both have more experience than your average rookie would. Um, and I think maybe you'll start to see this year, um, next year a little bit, when these guys who have that COVID year, who have just played a lot more football and, you know, more snaps and longer, there, there might be a little bit less of a wall. So I think given – that Fatanu and Frazier just have that so much experience and Fatanu did play a pretty long season last season. Um, it'll be minimized. I think, I think it's a great question and that there's definitely going to be some sort of impact, but I don't think it's going to be one of those things where we see them really start to fall off towards the end of the season, just because of how much football the two of them have played in their careers. Yeah, that's a great point. 15 games for Washington, having made it all the way to the national championship. I mean, that's, more or less an NFL season worth of games uh, for Fautanu last year. And so that definitely plays a factor. Great question there, Eric. And, you know, we'll see which side of the, the equation is stronger. Is it uh, better to have time to gel or is, or is it really going to be an issue to kind of hit these great defenses uh, kind of when rookies are starting to hit their uh, rookie wall? That is all for our episode today. Again, make sure to give the number at the bottom of the screen a call and leave us a voicemail like Eric did here from Philly. Uh, that's all for us today. Thank you. I'm Ross McCorkle. That's Joe Clark, and we'll catch you next time.